What's up, guys? We are going to do section one, um, or part one, of the DNA, RNA, and protein synthesis notes. So the chemistry of hereditary, or heredity, I'm sorry, by the 1940s, we had no doubt that chromosomes were a thing, um, and that genes were on the chromosomes, but we had many, many more questions outside of that. Um, we didn't really know what genes were, or what they did, how genes worked, or how genes determine the characteristics of an organism. <clears throat> now we know that genes must be capable of doing three things. The first is that genes must carry information from one generation to the next. The second is that genes must be able to put the information that they carry to work to produce traits or phenotypes of the organism. Um, and the last is that there must be a mechanism of easily copying the gene because information must be replicated every single time a cell divides. So what are chromosomes made of? Uh, chemical analysis has shown us that the chromosome is half composed of nucleic acid and half protein. Um, it was originally thought to be the protein portion that carried genetic information because very little was known about nucleic acids. Obviously, the hypothesis was wrong, and you'll find that out here shortly. So founders, which is pretty loose, uh, of the DNA structure were James Watson and Francis Crick in 1953. Uh, Mendel, it became obvious that Mendel's traits and heritable factors on the genes and chromosomes were composed of DNA. So DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA consists of small units called nucleotides. So several million nucleotides make up one strand of DNA. And they consist of a phosphate group, which is the P surrounded by oxygens, a five carbon sugar, which is the green, and a nitrogen base, which is the like gold uh, hexagon. So again, a phosphate, a sugar, a nitrogen base equal one nucleotide. Deoxyribose, there's also one called ribose, but deoxyribose is a five carbon sugar, um, a five carbon sugar. It is the blue on the left-hand side. Ribose, it has an OH. So nitrogen bases. We have four nitrogen bases, adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. These are all found in DNA, also known by the first letter, A, G, T, or C. So purines are those two on the bottom of the left-hand photo. They're double ring structures. Adenine and guanine are purines. And pyrimidines, which are the top row, um, are single ring structures. Cytosine and thymine are pyrimidines. And you might notice that there's another pyrimidine up there. It's called uracil. Um, but nitrogen-based uracil is only found in RNA. And we'll discuss uracil later in, this, later in the week. So the DNA backbone, nucleotides are joined together with a backbone. Um, the backbone of a DNA chain is formed by alternating sugar and phosphate groups. So here we see a nucleotide in its entirety. Um, phosphates are blue, sugars are gray. And this lovely little backbone. And then the nitrogen bases stick out on that side. Um, it might be important for you on the notes packet to label these on the photo at the top of page two. Up there, more nitrogen bases. So in 1947, Erwin Shargoff, was, he was an American scientist, and he discovered that the amount of guanine and cytosine bases were the equal in any sample of DNA. Uh, the same was true for the other two nitrogen bases, uh, adenine and thymine. They were the same in any sample of DNA as well. So the observation that A equals T and C equals G became known as Chargoff's rule, and at that time, observation was made. It was not clear why that was so important, but you will certainly find out as we move along. Uh, there was this woman, a British scientist. Her name was Rosalind Franklin. In the early 1950s, she began using this technique called x-ray diffraction to study DNA. Um, and by itself, the x-rays did not truly reveal the structures of DNA. Um, but it did provide clues, and these clues were that uh, the strands of DNA were twisted around each other in this helix form. They appeared uh, that the nitrogen bases were at the center of the molecule, and that um, the two strands of the structure, there, there were two strands in the structure. 
So at the same time that Rosalind Franklin was doing her work, we had uh, Crick and Watson trying to understand the structure by building different models. And unfortunately, uh, those models were getting absolutely nowhere. Uh, but in 1953, Watson was shown a photo of Franklin's x-ray patterns, and he immediately recognized um, how the DNA model was arranged. And, and within weeks, Watson and Crick built an accurate model that showed one, the structure of DNA, and two, it explained how DNA could carry information and how that information could be copied. So Watson and Crick described this DNA molecule as a double helix or spiral consisting of two strands that are wound around each other. So the double helix does look like a twisted ladder in the Watson and Crick model of DNA. The sides are formed by alternating sugar phosphate groups, and the rungs are formed by two nitrogen bases that pair together across the center of the helix, joined by a weak hydrogen bond. Uh, these hydrogen bonds form only between certain base pairs, so adenine is always bonded to thymine and guanine always paired to cytosine, which you can see on the right-hand side, they are color-coded. This is called the base pairing rules, and it explains Chargoff's rule. There's a reason why adenine equals thymine and guanine equals cytosine. So every adenine in the DNA molecule is bonded to a thymine, and every cytosine in the DNA will be bonded to a guanine. They are complementary base pairs. This is a closer look at the structure of DNA. Um, again, I would heavily, heavily suggest um, labeling these on the graph or the, the image on the pay, top of page three. Um, so you have the two nitrogen bases in the middle, the sugar phosphate backgrounds, and then that hydrogen bond demonstrated in the middle. So two sides of the ladder are made up of alternating sugar and phosphates. The rungs in the middle are nitrogen bases. Two bases form each rung, and the bases are covalently bonded to a sugar phosphate unit. The paired bases meet across the helix and are joined together by hydrogen bonds. So as a carrier of information, it was necessary property of genetic material that is to be able to carry genetic or carry information. The DNA molecule, definitely does that. Uh, the information is carried in the sequence of bases and any sequence of those nucleic bases is possible. Um, since the number of paired bases ranges about 5,000 for the simplest virus to approximately 6 billion, in human chromosomes, variations are infinite. Uh, if the DNA from a single human cell were stretched out, it would reach about six feet um, and carry information equivalent to 1,200 textbooks. Uh, yet all of that information is copied in a few hours with few to no errors. So how can it all fit inside of a cell? How can all that DNA fit inside a cell? It's a great question. Uh, the structure of the chromosome allows DNA to be packed very tightly. Um, and a chromosome, again, is composed of DNA and proteins. So the DNA is wrapped tightly around these tiny little proteins called histones. And together, the DNA and the histone molecule form a bead-like structure called a nucleosome. A nucleosome. <clears throat> now, nucleosomes pack together with one another to form a thick, fibrous rope, which is shortened by a system of loops and coils. And you can really see that on the left-hand side here. Nucleosomes will fold enormous lengths of DNA into tiny spaces available and create what we know as the chromosome. This is the end of tonight's notes. Again, make sure you're labeling those diagrams that we have. Um, and it's likely you'll get a nice quiz in the morning as we, we talk and we work through um, our understanding of base pairs and the basics of DNA.